Let us pray, please. Our Father and our God, Lord, we thank you for bringing us together again. Yes, sir. We thank you for every time you've been bringing us, showing us your truth. Again, oh Lord, we pray that you have mercy on us and you show us your truth, oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Be with our brother that will lead us, oh Lord, and be with his mouth, be with every aspect of his faculty and bless him on our behalf and bless us too as we hear your words. That your words will actually take root in our in our minds. We pray for our brethren that will be joining us later, oh Lord. And they bring them to their systems quickly. And we pray that our systems will all work fine. We pray for people that will be watching the program later on there, Lord, that you bless them. And you open their eyes to yourself. In Jesus' name we pray, Lord. Amen. 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 Yes. Yes, good evening, everyone, again, uh, from wherever we are, we are log logging in. Uh, Brad Joseph, uh, we thank God for, for what the Lord has been doing through him uh, for us and for people who are actually benefiting from what God has caused him to put together. For the time being, under God, he will continue to be of help to us in reminding us of the truth of God's word. So let's continue to pray for him, not only when this program is going on, but during the week. Let's pray for, for him that, yes, God will bless him and will bless us through him. You are welcome, Brad Joseph. Good evening, sir. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. In the morning, when I rise, in the morning, when I rise, in the morning, when I rise, words of the, that song is very relevant to what we'll be discussing today and uh, we're looking at uh, Christian discipleship and precisely we're asking the question are you a true or a false disciple of Jesus Christ who is a disciple a disciple is a learner a disciple is a student a disciple is a follower, someone who is under the master, someone who is imbibing the teachings of the master, someone who aspires to be like the master, someone who imitates the master, will be classified as a, as a disciple. We want to look at it from the Christian perspective, and more importantly, what Jesus said about it and what the Bible as the word of God says about Christian discipleship. And we'll attempt to answer that question based on the scripture. And for each one of us, the answer cannot be yes and no. The answer will be yes or no. Are you a true or a false disciple of Jesus Christ as defined by the scripture itself and by Jesus Christ. John 14, 21 says, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. So you don't follow a master 
if you don't have a love for the master. And you don't love the master if you don't abide by his teachings. It is not about how much of the teachings I'm ready to adhere to, how much of the teaching is palatable. You cannot cherry pick out of the teachings of the master and say, I love this part of the teachings. Uh, we abide by this. I will follow this. But all this, they are they don't, they are not relevant. They are obsolete. I don't like them. I'm not going to stick to them. So you are not a disciple if you do that. If you obey all, and we repeat all of his teachings. So for you now to obey all the teachings, you must know the teachings of Christ. And specifically, Christ made a lot of statements in the scripture about who is a true follower of him. So we'll be looking at all at this today. Right from the on go, uh, we want to mention that a Christian, a Christian disciple is fruitful. A Christian disciple abide in Christ. Jesus said, I'm the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. We cannot produce fruit out of by our own deeds. But it is impossible for you to abide in Christ and you are fruitless. It is impossible. The fruit will expose you, if we might use that word, the fruit will expose you that you are a disciple of Christ. With the Great Commission, towards the, by the end of the of uh, Jesus' uh, earthly ministry, he gave a command, a commission to all his disciples, and he said, especially to the uh, the disciples that were following him at that point in time, say, "You, these people, use my disciples. You've had my teachings. You witness the miracles. Now." I'm telling you, go out and make more disciples. Go out and make more of you, more of disciples, more of people who are going to abide by my teachings. Not only from Israel, not only from the Jewish nation, but from all the four corners of the world, if we say that. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all. And that's the key word there, all that I've commanded. Today, people do not want to observe all that Jesus has commanded. They've created the kind of doctrines that suit their desires. They are not disciples of Christ, but they are false disciples. And behold, I'm with you to, to, unto the end of the age. So following Jesus is according to his terms. This is what people get completely wrong. They make up their own terms. They make, they make their own definition of who, what it is to be a Christian and who is a Christian. And then they live by their own definition and their own parameter that they have set. No, you are not a disciple. You are only a disciple only if you follow Jesus according to the terms of Jesus. So Jesus has been explicit about his terms, the condition, the requirement, the characteristic, the attributes of anyone and of those who are going to follow him. And it's so important to get this right. Because that's what Luke 14, 28 was saying. It's actually better not to claim to be a disciple, not to make an attempt of following Christ. If you don't get this basic concept right. If you need to weigh it, you need to determine, you need to evaluate it and come at the conclusion that I am, am I ready to do this or not? But what we have today, people are being indoctrinated into false worship. 
because they have been told that Jesus loves you. Jesus is love. Jesus wants you to be rich. Jesus wants everything to be good with you. Come unto Jesus and you will live a perfect life. The trouble you have is because you don't have Jesus. Once you have, you have a crisis because there's no Christ. Once you have Christ, there's no more crisis. People are being deceived, falling into deception because they do not even understand who they are about to follow and the terms of the condition of this kind of relationship, which is better clearly in the scripture. Luke 14, 28 says, for which of you intend to build a tower? Sit and know them first and count the cost, whether you have sufficient to finish it. This is the first question we should ask. You should need to ask. Are you ready to do what is required to be a disciple? Because it's a journey. The Christian discipleship is a journey. Will you be able to stand and wait and follow the journey until the end? So there's no point starting that journey, going into what you call that relationship, if it's not according to the terms of Christ. And Christ in Luke 14, 28 says, you must count the cost right from the beginning. You need to get it right. Otherwise, you will not be able to stand unto the end. So we're not surprised, therefore, that we have a lot of false converts, of false disciples, of false Christians. And everywhere you have false Christians, false disciples, it goes, therefore, that you have false teachers, false people who are converting them. False masters, they make the same to the master. The only one that we should follow is Jesus Christ himself. The truth is that Christian followers decisiveship will come at a cost. And it's a very great cost, to be honest. Luke 14, 33 says, so likewise, we so ever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. This doesn't sound good at all. And yet, people are not told that this is Christian discipleship. Whosoever is not ready to forsake all cannot be a disciple of Christ. This is not my words. This is not my word. This is the word of Christ. You want to say that you are a Christian, but you are not a disciple. And so you are not going to forsake everything until you become a disciple. That's completely wrong. You cannot be a Christian without being a disciple. It is a, the word Christian is a coinage. It's a, you can even call it a nickname. An appellation that was given by people who are observing Christ, uh, um, uh, Christ followers. So they are mutating their, their master. They are following, they seem to be going along the lines and thinking and teachings and doctrine of that Jesus Christ that was crucified. Jesus said, Great Commission, go and make disciples of all nations. So if you say you are a Christian, you are a disciple of Christ. And if you're not ready to forsake all, you are a false disciple. Matthew 16, 24, then said Jesus unto the disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. If any man will come after me, in actual fact, to come after Christ requires a desire within you, you as a person. And a desire backed up with knowledge and understanding of who you are about to follow. And Christ is saying, if anyone desire, if anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself. What does he mean by deny himself? Some would think 
I think the mis mistake many people make is to think that that denier implies that uh, you don't have any earthly possession or you don't have anything good as described by, by the uh, parlance of the world. Yeah, that uh, you don't have anything, you are poor, you are dejected, that means you forsake all. That is not what Jesus Christ is saying. That is not. We'll see what precisely this means very soon. And one word comes to us there, cross. And take up his cross. Jesus took his cross. A disciple wants to be like his master. Why? You don't want to take the cross? But Jesus took up his cross. People will live within that uh, time, they have an understanding of what it means to take up your cross. And when Jesus was addressing them, they are in no doubt whatsoever as to what he was saying. He was saying that if you want to follow me, get ready to receive the bullet. As the people who are in the north of northern part of Nigeria, who have been persecuted, slaughtered in their house, all because they are the labor of Christian. If you want to follow Jesus, get ready to die. If you're not willing to die, if you aren't willing to crucify yourself and from the desires of this world, you know, ready. You are not a disciple, you are a false disciple. Because it follows that people who follow Christ will more or less try to commit suicide or look for death. No. Many followers of Christ will not actually die of persecution. Yes, many will not die of persecution. But there's none who follows Christ truly, who is a disciple, who will not be willing to die from persecution. Or being a Christian. Which means there's no one who is truly a disciple that is not ready to take his cross, that is not willing to lay down his life, if so necessary. And Christ is saying it at the very beginning. It's unlike what you do when you try to get a loan in the bank and they give you the terms and conditions and they have what we refer to as the small print. That is very it's written in very, very small characters. That even when you are given like five pages to read, you might not even read that. You overlook it. And that's the most important thing there. It is when you run into trouble with the loans that you go back and they say, no, it was written there. And then you say, where, where? I didn't say it. Oh, there is a small, it's written at the, you can see at the bottom, that small print, yeah. Because it's being concealed so that you don't know what it requires and what is the danger that is there to lure you into getting that loan. Jesus is not doing this. Christianity is not about deceit. Christianity is not about false hopes. Christianity, from the very beginning, if you want to be a disciple, Jesus said to the disciples, you must be ready to, to take up your cross. No wonder many people left him. Many disciples left him because they are not willing to take up the cross. What is happening today, it's even it's completely worse. False disciples, they are attracted where there is crowd. That, that crowd att attraction is there. False disciples are interested in where it is happening. Where is the noise? Who is trending? Who is commanding followership? Who are they talking about? Who is getting attention on Instagram? Who is the most popular pastor? Who has the biggest church? Who is joining the large crowd? Who is having the most extravagant uh, uh, worship? Who is having the best of musicians? Who has, is having the largest space? the largest cathedral. People would go 
are motivated by this desire, they are false disciples. They are attracted because of the crowd factor. Miracles, we mentioned this last week. False disciples are attracted by miracles, with the promise of the supernatural. So we're not surprised that people are therefore who have false, who have uh, uh, wolves in sheep's clothing, have made themselves into all these false teachers, false prophets, and they're promising the people what Christ did not promise. Because to tell them what Christ promised will not draw them here. It will repair them. And so what did they do? They decide to give to the people what the people want. And like all factors of economics or consumerism of demand and supply, this thing will work. And it works. And it's working. If there's a demand and there's a supply, hopes and expectations are being met. But the truth about it, are, this is, these are all false expectations and these are all false hopes. The false disciples are consumed with the desire of the flesh. It's all about what they can get. And therefore, they make a demand based on their expectation. And they are coming with an expectation of what they want. Jesus of the Bible is not promising them what they want. So they need another Jesus to supply it. All the Jesuses are the TB Joshua of this world. They are the general overseers of this world. The priority focus of a false disciple is not on God. The priority focus of a false, dis uh, false disciple is on his, his, earthly, his or her earthly desires. That's the primary focus. And we therefore see acts of worship that we call acts of worship, religious activities, which are false, false worship in its regard. So a, a false disciple has, has false worship. Although they might be religious, they could not have a title of a pastor, could not have been in the Christian gathering for so many years. They are having false expectations. And everything is built on false hope. Today, people are seeking for the physical. They're not seeking God. They're not seeking for spiritual truth. Jesus said in John 6, 26, Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were fed. We mentioned this last week, I believe. When they came to him after heard of the miraculous that he did, said, this man was able to feed thousands of people. Wow. So what's going to happen? We don't need to walk again. We just need to go to him and we have our daily supply of bread or loaves of food. That was the motivation. And Jesus began to draw uh, a, a mammoth crowd. A lot of people were looking for him. Where is Jesus? Is that not similar to what we have today? They say with their lips they're looking for Jesus, but within their heart they're looking for the food. And therefore they're not searching for spiritual truth. And when we were told that we shouldn't consider these people as ignorant, I think we, both, we got to agree with that entirely because they are willing accomplices. And God will always give the kind of teachers that people desire unto them. 
You see people today that are demonic, actually demonic. And you wonder, how can you not see that this is a demonic pastor? Calling himself, how, how can you not see it? But they are blindfolded by their desires. That's why they cannot see it. So the story, the context of the story was of John 6, 26. Uh, Jesus came from the boat. Um, and then let's go to verse uh, 27. Yeah, 27. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life. This is just saying people who desire, who are seeking, who claim to seek God, but seeking the desires and of this world, they want their problems solved. They want their uh, their situations to turn around for gold. They want to dominate. They want to be known. They want to have a perfect life. When all these people come forth, they are seeking something that is temporary. They are seeking something that is going to perish. And Christ said, this is foolishness. Labor not for all this but labor and seek for that which we endure for eternity. And who can all give you that? If the Son of Man shall give you unto him. For him at God the Father seed, then said unto him, and they now told him, because at this point in time, Jesus was avoiding the crowd. Because he knows these are, not, these are false disciples. The motivation is wrong. Then they said unto him, what shall we do that we might walk the works of God? And Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God that he believed on him whom he had sent. Even here, we can see that they're saying, okay, very well. So you're not promising us daily supply of loaves of, of, of bread and fishes. Okay. Then are you going to give us the power to do these things? I said, transfer the power to us. You see exactly what is happening today. If you cannot give us the daily supply, give us the ability to do it. We will we, we'll, we'll make the bread on ourselves. We'll bring down the bread on ourselves and we'll and we be fine. So we don't depend on you. These are false disciples. But Jesus said, the works of God that you say you want to do, just believe on him who he said, believe in me. The miracle is about me. Speaks of me. If you believe in me, then you do the work of God. And uh, as expected, many of them departed. They left him. If we consider the case of, uh, of Nicodemus, even the ruler of the Jews, someone who's supposed to have an understanding of the Torah, who approached Jesus, we see something also interesting, similar to what we are talking about. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that that uh, the teacher come from God. They acknowledge him. It's not, there's no dispute as to the fact that it's acknowledged. No one can deny the miracle of Jesus. Even at that point in time, not even the Pharisees can deny the miracles. But they're not willing to confess him as God. They're not willing to confess him as the son of God who was promised. Because Nicodemus said, no one can do these miracles that you have done except God be with him. We know you have a relationship with God Almighty. But Jesus said unto him, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now, we see the misuse of the word born again, which has become 
uh, is applied. Now, these days, that everyone is born again. But no one is ready to carry their cross. No one is ready to deny themselves. No one is ready to forsake all. And yet, all, they are all born again. These people, as prophesied by Isaiah 29:13, they draw near with, to me with their mouth and their, with their lips, do honor me. But have removed their heart far from me, and their felt fear towards me is taught by the precepts of men. False disciples think God exists to do what they want for them. They're seeking personal satisfaction and making demands of God. And if you make a demand of God, you are a false disciple. And this is the exact very opposite of a true disciple. Matthew 1924. 10 24. It says more or less the same thing. And we want to say that if you trust in the riches of this world, if you if you are defined by your possession, and your personality is defined by your attainment, and you trust in those attainments, you put your trust in those attainments and those your possession. And that's what defines you. You probably worshiping your possession. You probably worshiping your attainment. You probably not a true disciple of Christ. Because your identity as a true disciple of Christ is defined by the times of Christ and the fact that you follow Christ. And that you are forsaking all. Mark 10, 21. Then Jesus beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, we're talking about uh, this man that came to Jesus, and said, I keep all the commandments, I do all this. I said, well, what else? It, I have fulfilled everything. Oh, but Jesus said, one thing that you lack, go and sell whoever thou hast, and give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. Which means, he trusted in his riches is defined by that, and yet is not ready to forsake it. He's ready, not ready to place it above the call of discipleship. So the truth, we come to the truth. The truth is that as a true disciple, you have lost your sovereignty. You have lost your independence. As bad as it sounds. Independence in the sense that you are being ruled by your master. You are being ruled by Jesus Christ. So if you want to keep your sovereignty, if you want to keep your independence, you are saying, I want you to reign as Jesus, but I don't want you to rule my life. And if you cannot rule your life, he cannot be your master. That's what we see in Galatians 5, 24. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affection and lust. So the focus is completely on the master. We're looking at the words of Jesus. And you can see, we hear a lot that Jesus is saying about this topic. One extremely dangerous thing, which I would say uh, Satan has been very successful in doing, is creating the prosperity gospel. This is a tool for accumulating false disciples. If you believe the gospel, if you follow the gospel, you are for, it's in, incompatible with Christ's teachings. We've just seen some few scriptures. We don't have time to go into all. It's incompatible. It's at variance with it. There's just no way you put it side by side and say, we can match them together and make it work. What Christ said and what prosperity gospel says are completely opposite. And people think prosperity gospel 
They are the opposite of prosperity gospel is poverty gospel. So that'll be the defense. That you say, oh, people should not prosper. The opposite of prosperity gospel is not property, well, it's not poverty gospel. The opposite of prosperity gospel is true gospel. It's true gospel. Christ has not called people to be poor. Christ did not call people to be wretched. But Christ is calling people to lose control of their life. To hand over the control of their life unto him. To stop the focus on this world and change their gaze. The purpose of their life will change. A true disciple can be rich. Of course. Well, I know I'm talking richness now. We're not talking about spirituality. We're talking about possession. Why not? But a true disciple is not defined by its accomplishment. It's not defined. He doesn't gain his identity from what he has or what he can do. Because what happens is if you take that, that defines a man away, the man loses his identity. If you are defined by your riches, if that riches is taken away, then you are no more. You lose your identity. But an identity that is defined by Christ remains. So it's not the world that is defining you. So I mentioned it that the prosperity gospel is a very, very poisonous, dangerous, and probably, arguably, this is what's going to get more people to hear than any kind of thing whatsoever that we can think of. Because all these satanic pastors and satanic prophets, they are thriving because they market as it was created with a false gospel that is called prosperity gospel. So today, therefore, we can say that many people who call themselves Christians, many people who call themselves churchgoers, many people who call themselves pastors and deacons and apostles, and general overseers are actually false disciples of Christ. Christianity involves a transfer of ownership. That is what we've been saying. Christ came to buy us, to purchase us with us your blood. So he haunts you. If he haunts you and you surrender, you accept the fact that he haunts you, that you are even purchased with his blood, then you take dictations for him. It detects your life. It controls your life. It sets your priorities. First Corinthians 6, 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, ye of God. You are not on your own. Even your body, as we see in First Corinthians, belongs unto God. It's a dwelling place of God. And, and this is the contest. What? Uh, let's take 18. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that commits fornication sin and against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? Which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? You are not your own. So if you want to keep your identity, if you want to keep everything and uh, still claim to be a child of God, you're deceiving yourself because you have not actually surrendered your life. You have rejected the purchase that was done for you. So in essence, a false disciple will not accept the master for who he is, and what he promised. They've created their own masters. 
They've created their own expectation and they are following a different master and definitely not the Jesus of the Bible. Jesus asked the disciples, said, because if you're going to follow someone and you want to imitate that person and they begin to function like that person, begin to show, display the attributes of that individual, you must really know who you are following. So that's, that's just basic. You must be able to know who you are following. Jesus asked the disciples, who do you even think that I am? And if he's asking the disciples, he's asking you, everyone today, who do you think Jesus is? Who do you think Jesus is? When you open your mouth that you can decree and make anything that you want to happen, who do you think Jesus is? When you want to live a double life, who do you think Jesus is? When you're not ready to obey all the commandments in the scripture, who do you think Jesus Christ? I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. So without Jesus, you don't have a life, an everlasting life. Without Jesus, you don't have a truth. No one comment unto the Father but by me. Jesus is uncompromising. True Christianity is uncompromising. To see that you are a disciple, a true disciple, or a false disciple. And in verse 16, and Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon, but Jonah, for flesh and blood are not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and its gate of air shall not prevail against it. So Peter made an emphatic statement that is absolutely correct. He was able to identify the master. He was able to identify Jesus as the son of the living God. So now it's, that, that's the first question that needs to be answered. Now he's ready to follow the son of the living God according to these terms. But something interesting happened. Uh, so at this point in time, we remember the temptation. You see, what the, what the kind of temptation that Satan put before Jesus is exactly what he has presented with the prosperity gospel. Is the exact thing that is presented with the prosperity gospel. So this should let you know that this is the ploy of Satan to get people into hell, to worship him. It is actually satanic worship. Because during that temptation, Satan demanded worship from Christ. He demanded worship. And all these people that follow a, this prosperity gospel are worshiping Satan for this reason. Because you cannot accept that first gospel without worshiping the creator of that gospel. It is Satan himself. Verse 3, you see, the devil said unto him, without the Son of God, command this stone that be made bread. That's exactly what people want today. The commanding, what the commanding money, dollars. They want earthly desires, earthly pursuits. It doesn't really matter whether it's commensurate to the kind of work they put in. It's not about work, it's not about merit. It's just about miracles. Six, and the devil said unto him, all this power I will give thee. You see the desire for power as well. And that is why they do angel visitation. That is why they, they go into the grave to do grave soaking. That's why they're looking for anointing here and there that they're going to put on. God is seeking for power. All these things that Satan <laughs> tempted Jesus Christ with, I will give thee and the glory of them. 
for that is delivered unto me and to whosoever I will, I will, I give it. If that therefore we worship him, all shall be thine. This is the cross of the matter. So this prosperity gospel and all these false teachers that have built false followership and false disciples are all worshiping Satan. And that's not my words, though. That's the word of the scripture. And in their hands, they shall bear the up that, that oh, for it is written where when he told him to uh, to to uh, that's from five, nine. And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be son of God, cast thyself down from hence, for it's written, he shall give the same charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. But Jesus answered him and said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. I created you. You are a created being. How dare you tempt your creator? So false discipleship is about Christianity without the cross. And a crossless Christianity is satanic worship. So what they say is that give us this Christianity that has no cross involved. Give us this Christianity that doesn't involve us denying ourselves. Give us this Christianity that doesn't involve us following only, only what Jesus Christ has commanded. Give us that Christianity that we can be creative with and create our own ideas, our own truths, and get things that we, we can put together to help in as much as we achieve it. And we see at the labor of being a Christian, the end justify the means. Give us that Christianity that is liberal. Give us that Christianity that is accommodating. Give us that Christianity that tolerates sin. Give us that Christianity that doesn't judge. When the word of God judges, So true discipleship is about the, the process will involve a desire. It involves a denier. And as I have mentioned, a possible death. And for sure, the death that is, is, that is compulsory is the fact that you have to even to die unto the desires of the, of, of the world, of the flesh. So you come crucified in that sense, you carry your cross, and on that journey, you'll be crowned. After that journey, you'll be crowned. So you start your pilgrimage as a true disciple. Focus on the crown of glory. Knowing fully whether you are under the control of your master. Romans 12, 1. Now I'm painting the picture of what true discipleship is against this false celebrity focus, people placing ideology and doctrine, wrongly labeled biblical Christianity and being perpetrated by workers of iniquities who call themselves pastors and teachers of this world. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice Holy acceptable unto God, that's Apostle Paul, which is your reasonable service. In the whole testament, you bring a bull, you slaughter it as a sacrifice. This is saying you do a sacrifice, but you still remain alive. That's even worse. A living sacrifice that's not going to die permanently in, in that way because you still and the physical body, but here you have been crucified in a way. 
So it's hard. So we can understand that there will be a struggle. That ah, this is painful. I don't want to do this. You look at those who are outside, who are not following Christ, and then you say, why can't I be like them? You know that kind of a thing because you are you are still living. So it is demanding. You must count the cost to follow Christ. Then after Peter's confession that Jesus is the Son of God, now Christ told them and said, and he straightly charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and, and be slain and be raised the third day. And he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantage? If he gains this old world and lose himself, or be cast away. For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed. And when he shall come in his own glory, and in, in his fathers and of the holy angels. A lot of things jump out from that passage. Whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall save it. Those who want their best life now are actually having the worst. They are having the worst. So in a nutshell, a true disciple cannot be of this world. A true disciple is in this world, but cannot be of this world. His priority cannot be of this world. And in a way, what that really means is that you are saying, yes, I follow you. I count the cost. With or without, I remain with you. This is what's difficult for people. People want to claim the promises in the scripture on the, in the condition that it must be it must be exactly as they have the desire. They say, I want this. It is uh, well, God has the ability to do it very well. He must do it. If he doesn't do it, then I'm not, I can't, I, I can't accept that. That's the problem. And if you cannot accept that, you can't be a true disciple. It is when you're able to accept that, that you become a true disciple. With or without your desire. Your desire can actually come to pass. It can actually happen as you desire. It can actually happen. You want to be a multimillionaire. You can actually be a multimillionaire and be a true disciple. It's quite possible. But you want to be a multimillionaire. And Christ says, it's, it's not my will for you. Say, no, I'm not going to take this. But by whatever means going to happen, it has to happen. You are not a true disciple of Christ. Because you are not surrendered and you are not ready to deny yourself or carry your cross. And therefore, you are not following the Jesus of the Bible. We mentioned it already that the, a, a, a true disciple is ready to drink the same cup as the master. Christ told the disciples that this cup I drink, you're going to drink the same thing. And many of them did. They did. So it is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. So if they are called the master of the house visible, how much more shall they call them of his household? A, disciple, a, a true disciple will definitely face persecution. A true disciple will definitely be rejected. A true disciple might not be celebrated by this world. Twenty-six. Fear them, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and he that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light, and what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the astors. 
And fear enough for them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body here. That is that is the one that will follow. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that can kill the soul. And it's the fear of this world that makes it at times difficult for people. The rejection, the fear of rejection of this world, the fear of being seen as of being rejected or being inconsequential is so much that people are not ready to follow Christ fully. And it says, if you love this world more, then you don't love me. And if your love for me do not exceed that of your family, does not exceed that of your father, or your mother and your desires, then you are not fit to be my disciple. And that's what we mean by Matthew 16 25. Whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And if you actually lose your life for his sake, be assured that you will find it. The gain is far exceeds that which the world can give. And that which the world can promise. So it's all about Jesus. True discipleship is all about Jesus. He said, I'm the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eats of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread I will give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. This happened. This story happened after I gave them uh, do the miraculous of providing provision for them. Or for food. And, they, and they came to him and they said, okay. Now, what is special about what you have done? What's actually special? You, know, you gave us, yeah, you miraculously turned, uh, multiplied bread, and we're able to eat, and uh, so many of us, yes. What is special about what you have done? Give us this bread every day. The last time you did it, today there's no bread, and we have come, we come in our thousands. So give us this bread. And Christ said, and he said, this bread that you have given us, you think is fantastic, it's special. But Moses gave us bread for so many, how many years? He was giving us bread almost on a daily basis. So don't think you have done something that is spectacular in that regard. But can't search. Jesus, uh, Moses did not give you bread. <laughs> Moses did not give you bread. The bread came from the Father. I gave you the bread. But now, this is the bread. This is what Christianity is all about. The living bread that gives eternal life. But people want the bread that perishes in this world. The physical bread. The physical provision. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If mm -hmm. any man eats of this bread. So Jesus said, take it this bread. Actually, he said, take eat this bread. This is my flesh. Eat. Not in the regard of the Catholic nonsense. But he's saying, take me. Believe in me. Accept me. Because when you have me, you have an hope of an eternal life. And you live forever. So, trying to draw it to a close now. It is all about Jesus. True discipleship is all about Jesus. It's all or nothing. Philippians 3, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering be made comfortable unto the day that I may know him. That I know my Savior, even partake of the suffering because I will, you will be persecuted for his namesake. Round it up now. Mark it 36. What shall it profit a man 
So this the reason why it's difficult for people to say to become true discipleship is because of the love of this world. That's the main thing. But what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? Souls are perishing. Their souls are perishing. They bear the names of Jesus. Yet they are not. They are false disciples, false pastors, false teachers, false prophets. What shall it profit a man if he gains his whole world and loses his soul? The last warning was the, the one, warning that Jesus gave in Revelation 3 5 to the Laodiceans church. That church is similar to a typical church today, the wedding church, the church that is celebrated, the church that is attractive, the congregation that is think they are powerful. They are neither cold nor hot. They bear the name of Christ, yet they don't know Christ. Yet they are not Christians. And Christ is saying it's better you don't have anything to do. Don't use that label. Either you are cold or you are hot. Because why? Christ is warning, I will spit you out. And spitting out means I will vomit you because I've not been able to digest you. The master wants to digest the subject. I've not been able to digest you. And so I will vomit you out because you are disgusting. The first church is disgusting. The first pastors are disgusting. The first apostles are disgusting to God, to Jesus. What shall you profit a man if you gain this whole world and lose his soul? Just give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can take this whole world. Give me Jesus. So we finish with a word of this song that say, you can have this whole world, but give me Jesus. Jesus is more than enough. In the morning, when I rise, in the morning, when I rise, give me Jesus. Thank you very much for listening, and God bless you all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brother Joseph. May the Thank Lord you, continue to bless you and your family. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, sir. Uh, we give glory to the Lord Jesus Christ <clears throat> uh, for remembering us and for sending his words, his word to us. I, I, I thank God for for the privilege that he has given uh, that, is, that he has given me to speak his words, for me to hear his words. Uh, and I believe it's the same thing for everyone that is on this platform. And for even for people who are watching our program, um, I, I want to say that nobody has come to our program by accident. Nobody has come to a YouTube channel by accident. You will never come there by accident. How you get there, you do not know. Most people don't know how they get there. But according to the word of the Bible, it is God that is using his own means to draw people to himself. My prayer is that what God is doing in drawing you to himself will not be a means of condemnation in eternity. Uh, the, the Bible somewhere says that when when you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. When you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Let me be very frank with you. 
we 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 do not we do not promote any human being here. We don't because we are actually sinners. From the smallest to the highest, we are sinners. Paul Paul described himself as the chief of the sinners. Present tense. Present tense. That is what he used. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. He didn't, he didn't write of, of whom I was chief. We do not forget, we do we don't forget our we don't forget our sinfulness. We don't forget where we came from. Because if you do, if you do, you will underrate, you will underestimate the majesty and the honor of the of the Lord Jesus Christ, of the of the person who saved you. Paul described himself in the present tense. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. To let people know that he meant what he was saying in Romans chapter 7. He was describing himself in present tense too. He called to describe himself in present tense. Whatever, whatever, whatever little holiness you see in us, is the holiness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that people who God is drawing, because the, the, I want to give glory to God that what you have listened to, you will see there are passages upon passages upon passages of the Bible itself. We, we don't have opinion here. We don't have philosophies to sell. We don't have ideas. The only thing we do is simply to read the Bible and to the glory and majesty of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ, reading the Bible and believing it, following the Lord Jesus Christ has been more than enough. I pray to be the same for everybody. Not only people who participate in this program, but even people who are, who, who are watching the program later on. That's a prayer. People who get drawn to the Lord Jesus Christ, to the Christ, to the true God of the universe. And they will know him for, for truth. Yes, I, our, our brother said something again. I want to, I just want to repeat him, what he said so that we will never forget it. A few years ago, what he said today about the fact that the prosperity gospel was actually put together by the devil in order to drag people to hell. I, I came to that conclusion a few years ago. And that conclusion is still the same thing. As sad as it is, so that people will, people will have outward form of Christianity. So that when you ask A, when you ask B, when you ask, they, will tell, they are Christians. But they are Christians that have been suborned. They are, they are Christians that are, that are eating the poison, the temptation of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are not running away from it. They, they, are, they are gulping it down. That the, the physical universe, the money, the wealth, the majesty, the glory, will supersede anything about God. They do not know that that is idolatry. They don't know that is idolatry. It's, a, it's something that we must continue to say to people. People who are in churches or fellowships, where they say that they are in prosperity gospel, they are actually mm -hmm. idolaters, they are idol worshippers, they are enemies of, of, of God. What Christ rejected are the things you are being fed every day. He therefore asked Christ to command the stone 
to become great. And people are teaching today that they can decree that the soul will become great. And they will feed on it. That is how they are teaching. That mm -hmm. They can teach you that you can decree. The glories of this world. Christ showed us that no, it is the glory of God that we should strive for. The devil set up a movement and actually packaged it with doctrines upon doctrines upon doctrines that no, it is the glory of this world that should form the preeminence in your thinking. Thank you, Brad. Just uh, thank you. May God be with you and bless you. <coughs> Do we have uh, yes, yes, and uh, Well, um, I just want to thank God. You actually, I open my mic to say so many things, but <laughs> you have said it. But however, you quoted the uh, um, Psalm ninety-five. Uh, we are we are the Bible from verse six said, oh, let, uh, oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before our Lord and our maker. For he is our God. We are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, you hear his voice. Verse eight said, had it not your heart. As in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Brother and sister, Two set of people we watch. We watch this video. Two set of people. People we had in their heart, and people who, by the special grace of God, will be loosened from the grip of Satanism. Who will turn from idol worshiping to the living God? You have what, you have what the brother said: living sacrifice. How does how can the sacrifice be living when it's slaughtered? That is God. Living sacrifice. But he said that. I don't know how it left in my in, in my heart at all. Look at that little simple explanation. However, you have so many times in the, the prosperity movement. Uh, they cause one total, total salvation or something. Look, when they may, when they say that, they don't mean that uh, you are you are saved from your sin. They simply mean that you you have been taken from uh, poverty into plenty. I was talking with a young woman here. Uh, probably she should be about that or something. Trying to, and she said, "Look, there was a day I wanted to go somewhere, and it was raining, and I just said, God, because it's my father, he lost me. God, I don't want it to rain, and the rain stopped. I laughed. I laughed. said, you don't know what you are saying. You actually do not understand what you have said. These are the things, and they are from home." They are from the pit of hell. I'm telling you, they are from the devil. If you want to be my disciple, carry your cross. Really, and follow me. You think cross, carrying cross is easy? Daily, daily, not carry it there and then I will make you my disciple. Daily, as long as you become, as you are a believer. And until you, the death closes your eyes. These are the words from the scripture. What from the Drop not the word and the things that are in the world. And these are the things that they are actually promoting you to go. Brothers and sisters. Moses said, today I present before you life and death. Choose life. Okay. But, but, uh, 
I just thank you, Prashwana, that you don't put anybody here. Look, every single person that is here is being led by the Spirit of God. And it doesn't matter. And those people who are going to watch this as well, they are being led. I mean, like I said, some, because uh, 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 John 16, 8, that he will convict the world of sin. That doesn't mean some people will take it, some may not take it, even when they are convicted. <laughs> God bless you all. Bless you, brother, uh, brother Joseph, and every, every single one here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, Raquel, the ladder go. I can see a hand. Yeah, yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir, for this opportunity. I really appreciate God for what he's doing. I thank God for uh, our brother Joseph that God has used to be a blessing to us today. Um, we are talking about um, being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And um, it, right from the last week up to this week, um, the Lord has been trying to let us know exactly what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, we Just like we said, from the build-up from last week up till now, it's important for people to understand uh, what it means to be a disciple of Christ, what it means to seek Christ, you know. Um, the Bible says in Revelations 4, 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive all glory and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Which means God created everything for His pleasure, not for our pleasure. So it must be important for us to know that we have to separate our pleasure from God's pleasure, which means what may please us at a particular time may not be what is pleasing to God. So as a child of God, just like the Bible encourages us to look at Job as an example in the book of James, to take a clue from Job. Job went through a lot of suffering. In fact, Christ already is our perfect example of suffering and how he entered into his glory after suffering. So the Lord has already prepared us to be, to be prepared to go through this world, and we are going to go through a lot of sufferings. If you do not realize that God um, can be glorified through your sufferings, then you're not a disciple of Christ, as in you're not a disciplined follower of Christ, because just like we have heard, you have to deny yourself. Take up your cross. That's already a symbol of suffering and shame, the cross. We have a crossless gospel today. People that come and say, just like we talked of the prosperity gospel, people that come and say, God has promised us everything here on earth, you know, uh, which is a very, very big error. At the end, he said, he said uh, be of good cheer, little children. It is your father's good pleasure to give unto you the kingdom. At the end of the day, when Christ returns, he's going to give unto us the kingdom, you know. But right now, the pattern he has set for us is the pattern of suffering. But we have people today preaching a, a dominion theology, a reigning theology to reign and to, you know, take over the world and all that. Those doctrines are doctrines of devils. You know, they are producing false converts. So it's so important for us to know that God's pleasure supersedes every other thing. So now concerning prayer, we've talked of prayer also. Uh, we talked about miracles. It's important for us to understand that anybody that is, um, is a miracle monger is not a disciple of Christ. And that's exactly what the Pentecostal movement is about. The Pentecostal and charismatic movement. They are miracle mongers. They believe that the reason why the church is there is to solve people's uh, physical problems, material problems. So they set up shop just the way the, the babalawos, the, the witch doctors, the shamans, the way they set up their shop. They set up shop and they call it a church, whether it's online like Jerry Eze does, whether it's a, a church building, 
the ark or whatever, like winners and the redemption camp, they set it up, you know, and they, they, they begin to sell miracles. They use it as a selling point. To, the, the idea is to attract people to, to Christ. Well, it's not to Christ, no. Once you once you come that way, what you do is that you're 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 attracting, you're bringing people to come and have their to you know self gratification, to come and to come and have their own pleasure, what they want. You see, we must realize. I keep talking of the authority of the apostles and the prophets. The apostles were given authority to do signs and wonders. Jesus, of course, the Son of God, did it to show that he is the Messiah. The apostles were given authority because he chose them himself so that they can bring the revelation of God. God wrote it. Jesus didn't write any, by, any scripture, but he appointed them so that when he has gone, they will bring the scripture to us. So he had to back them up with, authenticate them with signs and wonders as what the bringers of the revelation of God. Those people are not just preachers. I usually differentiate between preachers and bringers. These people are bringing direct revelation from God. They were bringers, so they have to be authenticated. We are just preachers. We are preaching what they have brought. Because what they brought was the words of the Father that was given to Christ that he delivered to them. That's the words of the Father. That's why you see Hebrews say that he, you know, he has spoken by his son. He spoke by prophets, but now he has spoken in past tense. So what are we to do? We have to take the more earnest heed to those things that we have said, that have been spoken, that we have learned. That's the Bible. You have to look back to know, you know, it is to baffle me when... They go, they ask Jesus, you know, they question Jesus. They describe they question Jesus. I say, ah, uh, what the, the, the issue of uh, the divorce? No, it wasn't the issue of divorce. It was in Matthew 19 when they asked Jesus. They, those were the, the Sadducees, the ones that didn't believe in the resurrection. So they say, ah, what of that woman that had seven brothers marry her and died? When, when they, in the resurrection, whose wife would they be? Jesus did not say, you know, I, you know, I'm the son of God, and every morning I, 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 I spend time with God. We are in touch. In fact, right now, God just spoke to me right now. He just spoke to me right now. And what he's telling me right now is that uh, you people don't know what you're talking about. He just told me now that you don't know what you're talking about. In fact, I, I, I can ask him now, and he can tell me everything. You don't hear Jesus talk like that. Jesus pointed them back to the scripture. But you see, the Pentecostals want to normalize what they see in scripture when God speaks to people. They want to normalize it, giving them direct revelation. They normalize that that's how God wants to speak to everybody. No, that's not how God wants to speak to everybody. God wants to speak to everybody through his words, through the, the witnesses of those that he chose to bring his words to us. So they want to tell you, you hear a book like Good Morning Holy Spirit that tries to tell you how you can develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit, an active, you know, relationship, ongoing relationship. Say, do you know the Holy Spirit? You hear a book like uh, from Paul Yogyacho, Holy Spirit, my senior partner. Do you know the Holy Spirit? Have you spoken to him today? God does not, that is not the plan of God. God wants you to go to the Bible. He has spoken to us by his son. So please, anybody that is selling miracle, just know that that person, see the apostles, they were given authority. Peter can say, silver and gold have I not, but what I have, I give to you. Peter can say that because he has the authority of Christ. He was given the power of attorney. That's what Peter had, the power of attorney in the name of Jesus. So he cannot say, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. We don't pray like that. We are not apostles. If you notice, even in the New Testament, Acts 14, when they stoned Paul, if you notice what the brethren did, the Bible says the brethren came around him and they were praying to God. They did not say, Paul, rise up in the name of Jesus. We command you, we decree and we declare, you shall not die, you shall live and declare. They did not do all that. They pleaded with God, they begged God and God, he rose up. They didn't raise him up. We don't have that authority. That's why you see James in James 5 say, is anyone sick among you? Call the elders. It's not one person. But, in, but if an apostle is around, look for, if there is a Peter around, get a Peter. He will come and raise him up. If there is a Paul around, get a Paul. The authority of the apostles, they will raise him up. 
but not the brethren. The brethren, it's 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 the elder. It's not even one. You see, when you see churches today with one person as the GO, with one person as the final authority, the ball stops at his, you know, the final decision is made by him. That is not the structure of the church. That's what the Roman, that's what the Constantine brought in to the Roman Catholic Church. Where you have one pope, the person that hears from God uh, is a set man, and others just follow his vision. No, that's not the Bible says appoint elders. Paul told Timothy, a title say appoint elders in every place, just as I appointed you. So they had a body of elders. So there was a group. So he said, call the elders, let them pray. They pray to God. They don't come and say, Rise up in the name of Jesus. I command you in the no, they don't do that. So please let us know. So when, what I'm saying is that if you see someone doing that, that's what you see the Pentecostals doing today. They are claiming that authority. Just know that that is false. They are not disciples of Christ. They are not following Christ. So I plead with us, let us follow the scriptures. Let us humble ourselves before God. Let's make supplications. Let's plead with God. You heard what Baba said. Baba, if I, the way you get saved is the way you stay saved. The way you get saved is the way you stay saved. You don't stay saved by decreeing and declaring. I decree that I'm born again today. I declare that. I'm... No, you get saved pleading with God, just like the, the, the publican hit his breast. He couldn't even lift up his face. We are all sinners. Look at what Baba said. He couldn't even lift up his face. He said, forgive me, Lord, I'm a sinner. That is how you stay saved. That is the same way you keep approaching God. You don't approach God and say, oh, okay, that was then. Um, we've now grown. We, I know who I am now. I know. Who, maybe you hear somebody talking like that. You know that the person never met Jesus. You, you can't meet. See, Mary Magdalene never got over salvation. Never. John chapter 12. That was just close to Jesus' death. Too. That was not when Mary Magdalene got saved, when she broke the alabaster box. Look at how she was crying. She couldn't even lift up her head. You never get over it. So if you want to see a true Christian, it's not the one that says, I know who I am. That person does has no clue who he really is. He has been deceived. If you really know who you are, you will cry like Paul. You say, oh, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from the body of this dead? If you really know who you are, you will cry like Isaiah. I'm a man of unclean lips. Dwelling amongst people of unclean lips. You will cry like that. So please let us know the difference. And if we are, if we find ourselves, because sometimes you catch yourself because of how long you've been in these practices, you catch yourself wanting to behave like that. Please remember and humble yourself before the Lord and submit yourself to the authority of God. If God chooses to heal you, fine. If he chooses not to heal you, we rejoice, just like Paul, we glory in our tribulation. You can you can pray a second time, you can pray a third time. If he doesn't heal you, it's okay. The, the point is not your convenience. It's not about your pleasure. The point is, God, please, I want to rejoice in my suffering if I have to. So I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I've seen uh, the the hand of uh, Sister Elizabeth. Uh, Uncle Kofo, is Uncle Kofo with us? Is Uncle Kofo with us? If he's with us, he'll be praying for us after everybody has uh, raised his issue. I'm assuming on Google Voice is with us, but if it is not with us, then we have to choose somebody else. Yes, Sister Elizabeth. Good evening, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me. I'm outside, so it's a little bit windy. Um, the only thing I want to add is this idea that we, we need to say many, many times. There are no new revelations. The reason why the early Christians rejected Islam is because we were told, this is it. The canon is closed. Nothing we could be told to disagree with what is written in this Bible. And we have to please speak to those around us and even ourselves when we catch ourselves forgetting that when people say, oh, this or that or that, does it line up with the Bible? No new revelations are going to be given. The word of God is sealed. The things that we need in the Bible is point is to take us to Christ. It's to save us. Not to tell us how to be rich, not to tell us all of those things. And we need to remind all the people around us about truly the whole purpose of Christianity. It's for salvation and salvation only. It's for what would happen after we leave this world. Thank you. That's what I wanted to add. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, yeah, um, is, is Uncle Kofo with us? 
Okay, if if it is not, the answer yeah, is yes, okay. Yes, 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 okay yes. I, I, I mean, I mean, where I was, uh, there was a noise, so I had to move from that place. Okay. I didn't want to open my mic okay. where, where I was. Oh, okay, okay, okay. okay. Yeah, do, do, do we have any other call before Uncle Kofo prays for us? Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we want to thank you for a day like this. We thank you for bringing us together from every nook and corner of this world. We thank you for the freedom that we have, that we can uh, gather online to study your word. There are many that desire to have this kind of something, but if they got caught by the authority, they, be, they might be put in jail, persecuted, or even killed for their faith. We thank you for this freedom. We pray we, we continue to have this freedom for long, whereby many, many sinners will come to know you through this ministry. We pray for our brethren that we are not here today. We pray that as they listen to the uh, to the broadcast or to the raw um, video from uh, Skype, they will be blessed as we are. We pray for those who we come by the, uh, your divine uh, ordination to listen to the uh, full broadcast on YouTube. We pray that your word will touch them, most especially those who have not known you. There will be something that will challenge them and bring them to the state of your Christ. It, it is not our eloquence, but it will be your word that they will hear and we touch their hearts and bring them to the saving knowledge of Christ. And those who have been saved, who hear it, they will even try and uh, spread it to people who are not yet Christian to bring them to the saving knowledge of Christ. Father, we just thank you for keeping us as one. We thank you for mm-hmm. your Holy Spirit that lives and dwells in every true believer. We pray for our brother, which you have used today. We pray that you continue to Teach him more and more, and he will continue to bring your word to us, and your word will continue to quicken us and quicken our mortal body, and then we will be, will be a true ambassador of yours to live and declare your glory on this service of the earth. Father, we just bless you. We pray that you keep us as one until we meet again next week. To you alone be the glory, honor, and dominion forevermore. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.